Hello again, welcome to the CCWS podcast. I'm Rob High in Oklahoma City, joined by my partner, Philip Naiman, out in California. How are you, Phil? Uh, I'm doing great, but actually I'm in Prescott right now, where uh, my business is opening up a new office here. So this is the first day in the Prescott office, and we're still working out a few bugs uh, on the internet service here. So bear with us, if all of a sudden I freeze frame for about an hour. Very nice. Um, Coming into this new year, uh, we've got tons of new members, tons of new gun owners, um, people that are brand new to this and have stepped up, accepting the responsibility of gun ownership. Uh, and I kind of want to touch base and just put a bug in your ear about uh, some things you can do, not only to, to let you see your own progress over time. Um, but these are things that could come up and be beneficial to you in the event that you really did have to defend yourself in uh, a critical incident, in a lethal force self-defense incident. Um, I, I've talked with Phil about this. CCW Safe is based as far as our response, the things we cover, the things that we do for our members um, were based on the police union model. So if I was active duty law enforcement, I was involved in an officer shooting um, immediately. I've got not just other officers coming to secure the scene and make sure everything gets processed, but I've got investigators that are coming, attorneys that are coming, um, chaplain services, if I need it. Um, we're going to bring in crime scene specialists. We're going to bring in reconstruction people later on, if necessary, so they can completely redo an accident or they can redo a, a shooting scene or whatever. Um, and one of the things that I did when I was an officer was uh, would represent the department in the city in lawsuits against police officers. Um, most of those involved force or shootings. Um, the very first thing that I would do would go to work on capturing all the data on the training that you've received, the successful training that you, you've done and completed to satisfaction and that kind of thing. Um, and I don't want to put it out there and go, you know, well, this guy shot 100%, that guy only shot 72%. <clears throat> for those reasons and for the, the little nitpicking things that can, that can come up in a court of law, um, it's a pass or fail. Phil passed this course. Rob passed this course. Um, but for my own personal G whiz folder, um, I know when I was a brand new officer, I was not real proficient with a handgun, not to my satisfaction. Um, and I started going out to the gun range. I was shooting all the time, but it was just aimlessly wandering. I, you know, I put a whole bunch of rounds down range, but there was no purpose. There was no, you know, what am I working on today? Um, so I had a good buddy of mine that, actually with my dad's next door neighbor, um, but he was a high master class shooter, um, shot for the Marine Corps pistol team, shot for the police department's pistol team after he left the Marine Corps, um, super, super good guy. And I asked for his help and he started helping me. And it was amazing that he, he was breaking down just basic shooting fundamentals that whether it was for stress or for failure to, to get that information across or whatever, I didn't, I didn't absorb all of those things when I was going through my firearms training. And so he would give me one piece at a time. We didn't move forward until that piece was done. And that may, may take a couple of weeks, um, but we shot three times a week. We shot every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Go ahead. Wax on, <laughs> yes. wax off. Yes. Yeah. I, I was a little slow. I didn't, I didn't get the full measure of that, but it was amazing that within 
just a couple of months, I went from being very marginal to now I was formidable. <laughs> and I had a lot of confidence and a lot of faith in that skill set. Um, and it was kind of it was kind of silly because I wasn't as good as I thought I was at that point in time. And he swapped out targets on me and said, now, now we can leave beginner school and it's time to begin study. Um, but it was amazing how far I came, how quickly I, I progressed. Uh, and, you know, back then I was, I was keeping track of that only for me. Um, when we talk about training, um, I'm, I'm setting in good habits. I'm setting in things that, that prepare me mentally, physically, um, and for those that have never been involved in a gunfight, uh, it's the most important timed event you'll ever be in. Um, the guy that gets rounds off accurately on target first is the guy that survives and wins. Um, I have been in hundreds of armed confrontations, um, successfully walked away from every single one of them. Um, but there was a lot of training and preparation that went into that. So when we, when we talk about this, we, we're talking about building skill sets um, and, and causing external pressures uh, to make me better. Uh, the first time they ever started a stopwatch on us, you know, you got, we're going to stand at the 15 yard line, we're going to shoot 12 rounds, but I need mandatory magazine changes. So it's going to be four plus four plus four. And you got 20 seconds to go. I was like, holy crap, that's never enough time. Well, once you become competent with magazine changes and, and becoming uh, as efficient as you can with your movements and, and things like that, your draw stroke, um, picking up your, your sights and getting on target, and the reset of the gun after, the, after it fires, those things, um, you can go way faster than that. Um, but as a brand new shooter, man, that's, that's unbelievable stress. It was like, holy crap, that's all I got. Um, so I, I like having those external stressors that come on. So um, when we get into this, I don't care if you keep a notebook, there's some apps out there that you can get that, that kind of chart this stuff. Um, but there's so many things that if you've never done it before and you're new to this, um, you really don't know. And, and the bonus is you don't have to re reinvent the wheel. I mean, I failed over and over and over again. Learn from my failures. I can I can tell them all, all to. Um, so if if I was going to ask you to to come in and explain to me what you did on your last range visit with your handgun, Phil, what tell, what are the things that you think might be important to to document? You know, actually, it's funny because. Well, last month in December, I shot uh, a course, practical pistol out here, and it was the one time I shot all year, right, uh, for that particular thing. So I actually went to the range on purpose uh, and on the back end so I could actually draw and fire and uh, move between the targets. So um, my actual last training session with my pistol involved, you know, with the timer, drawing, putting rounds on target, switching to another one, doing magazine changes. Uh, changing lanes of fire and it was fun it was probably more fun than the competition was to be honest with you <laughs> i was faster on my own um no but it was it was it was exactly those skill sets and uh, you talked earlier about documentation and uh, as i was sitting here thinking about that most of the people i've taken courses from they actually give you a certification or some kind of a documentation at the end um, of what their course of fire was that you had this. Absolutely. Um, and that's one of those things that I want. Um, if I go out tomorrow and I go out by myself, that's going to be something that's, that's noted in, in my records. Um, I went on this day to 
the CCW safe range. And I worked on basic pistol fundamentals. So I shot from, well, and I, I like, I, I like having in, where did I go? Was I alone? Did I have instruction? Um, when did I do it? Um, and then how many rounds did I, did I go through? Uh, Cause I've, I've gone out and I've, I've had days that I just was not, I just wasn't dialed in, you know, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen that day. Instead of just going out and wasting a bunch of bullets, it was just like, yeah, I'm done. Uh, so how many rounds did I, did I shoot? Was I scoring them? Um, and, and how did you do? Um, were you shooting from multiple distances? Were you shooting from multiple positions? Um, were you putting yourself under time constraints? And, and what were those time constraints? Do you document the fact that, you know, through this course of fire, I, I forced myself to, to make mandatory magazine changes or whatever it is like that. Um, so, you know, what is it that I'm working on? As a, as a concealed carrier, I have a mission. I mean, I, my mission would be a little different than, from other people's mission because I've, I've had a high level of training. I've, I've been involved in a lot of these situations. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be the same thing for uh, my next door neighbor who's a concealed carrier. He's never been through all that training. He hadn't had the same experiences. Um, so his mission is a little different. So uh, we start out, everybody has to learn basic shooting fundamentals. Um, but from that point, you need to start expanding and growing. And, you know, it's one thing to stand there stationary at the seven yard line and put rounds on paper with a target that's not moving, it's not going anywhere, it's not, it's not coming at me with, with evil intentions, it's just a piece of paper. Um, and it's probably a green silhouette too, so. Yeah, it's it's terrifying, terrifying. Um, but it, we're working on certain things. And once I've developed my basic shooting fundamentals, now I can get into things that, that whether it's a boom and shoot thing or a positional thing or uh, increasing your times or whatever, um, or diminishing your, your target. Um, we, we don't ever really improve until we press ourselves and force ourselves to get better. Um, and, that, and that goes for all things in life. Um, well, you know, I think that's, as I'm listening to and understanding more, like when you first brought up this topic, I was, I, I was trying to see how that would work all the way around. But the more you're, you're explaining it um, from your mindset coming from the police department where you had to document training, you had to say, this officer is proficient in this, 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 and this. Here's how he was kept up to speed on it. Um, it comes down to on the personal side you know, if you go to the gym, here it is, we're in January, everybody's now going to the gym if they're allowed to or whatever. But um, if you just go to the gym, it's like shooting the paper at seven yards static with two boxes of ammo, and your target ends up looking like a shotgun pattern, because you weren't focused on anything. If you go to the gym, and you've got your booklet that says I'm going to do this many sets of this exercise at this weight, and you check that off, and then you do the next one, and you do the next one, you have a plan. Now you've been trained. And now you have progress from going to the gym. Yeah, it might be a little sore the next morning, but you're you're doing the right thing and it's growing you the right direction. And to apply that to our shooting disciplines, I think you're making a great point, Rob, that you know, maybe what I need to practice is I need to practice on presentation um, from concealed. You know, maybe I need to practice appendix draw. Uh, as I've explained to you guys before, I love to do that with an airsoft gun because that's the way I like to practice <laughs> appendix draw. <laughs> You know, or, or an empty, empty firearm. There's actually a magazine out there for Glocks. I have them for my 19s, 17s, and 21s. It's called a double click. And so the gun's completely empty. 
and you put this magazine in, cock, you cock it, put the magazine in, and it will reset the trigger every time. So you can dry fire your Glock, and instead of just the one pull and you have a dead trigger, it resets. So you can you can practice your drawing and your firing, drawing and firing, and, and uh, you know moving target to target. So that's a great um, that's a great little thing. Jason Mayashiro, one of the top shooters out here, um, showed me that he practices with it all the time. So that's a double click magazine worked out really well. But again, it's a safe way with an empty firearm to practice these things. Because what from what I've seen, I haven't seen any accidents up close and personal. Thank God, I don't want to. What I've seen on some of the videos People have their accidents drawing the weapon and they have their accidents reholstering the weapon. Unless they drop it in between, that's usually the only thing that happens is as they're drawing, they hit the trigger or as they're putting it back in, they're not clear. So if you're doing that with uh, an inert weapon, but still getting your reps in, so to speak, I think that would be a great idea. Well, and you know, you touched on a point I wasn't even thinking of, but uh, I, I, I need to begin this documentation. Was this a live fire exercise? Was this a dry fire exercise? Um, because I don't, you know, I don't have unlimited resources, unlimited funds, unlimited ammunition. You know, mon money is an object, um, and it, it is for all of us. And ammunition is absolutely at a premium now. Um, so I can I can continue to work my skill set. And there's all kinds of things out there. I mean, you can you can buy the little laser things that you can feed into your your firearm. You can do you know digital training uh, in the house, um, and it's one of those that you know, every single time we go back to firearm safety things. That every single gun is one, and I, I make sure that everything gets gets properly cleared and, and handled that way. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, even beyond, I'm not, I'm not practicing by myself today. You were talking about uh, some of the instruction you get and the certificates you get from these instructors. Um, that's that's another one of the things. Who who is this guy? What are his credentials? Uh, where did the training take place? What was the training? Um, did I have to hit a certain measure to to satisfy the performance objectives of that course, um, things like that. Um, <clears throat> and then once you've developed a little bit of a skill set, um, we step forward and go, okay, I can, I can make the little hangy down thing, come back and forth and I can make it go bang and, and all that stuff. Um, I like the way you instinctively turned your hand sideways. That was good. Absolutely. I wrote game. Lots of practice. I don't know how to do that. Um, that's funny. Uh, but once you've, once you've got that baseline and you're, and you're, and, and it never goes away. It's something you need to continue to work on. So like Phil was talking about, I go with the airsoft and do some dry fire exercises in the house or, or airsoft, you know, firing practice or, or whatever, um, or the, the magazine reset for the Glock. So I, I don't have to keep resetting every single time I, I press the trigger. Um, but once you've developed a little bit of that skill set, now it's time to start to kind of increase that pressure. I want to, I want to, I want to make myself adapt and become better than I am. So that can be all kinds of stuff. And, and, you know, do I, do I go out to the range outside? Is it an indoor range? Um, most of the stuff I did was, was an outdoor range That's what the police department had. That's where I, I've got thousands of hours on that range. Um, was it, was it windy? Was it bitter cold? Was, was it extremely hot? And I've, I've been on the fire line out there when it was 115. I've been on the fire line. We had to wait until the weather got up to 10. 
Um, I've been out there when it was pouring down rain and it doesn't matter if you're, if you're in law enforcement or military, or whatever, you're in a position that you don't get to pick your conditions. You got to work in whatever you're working in. So those are things to, to document that, that yes, I've, I've done these things um, as a concealed carrier. Um, it's one thing to, to go, hey, I'm going, going to the indoor gun range today and I've got a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and there's nothing to really to defeat to, to come from concealment, but um, have you shot with a winter coat on? Have you shot with gloves on? All of those things are, are factors that have completely changed what you thought your skill set was. Um, am I shooting stationary? I'm, am I moving and shooting? Um, do you do low light training? Um, there's there's all kinds of these things that you need to need to factor in. Um, I've I've had the fortune to be in a position to go, I've, I've shot through a hollow core door. I've shot through sheetrock. I've shot through a car. I've shot in and out of a car window. And to understand what those things can, can change uh, on the performance of your firearm. Um, it, it's, it's not something that everybody gets the opportunity to do. I understand that, but the things that we do with that, even if it's moving and shooting, shooting off the X or whatever I'm doing, um, I, I like guys moving forward or backwards or laterally or however, but um, armed confrontations do not take place in static positions. Um, Unless you're at a saloon with a wide brimmed hat, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just whoever's faster. Um, that's funny. Um, well, actually, that's another kind of practice we just did. Uh, took my son and, and uh, my son-in-law, and we did cowboy quick draw in Rancho Cucamonga with the deputies. And they had Ruger Vaqueros. Uh, they've nicely done Vaqueros, not stock. Um, 45 Long Colt. And it's fired with a 209 primer and a wax bullet on a timer. Now that's a kick in the pants. So, so that, that's some good practice there. That is. We have video documentation of that one. That is so cool. <laughs> um, does it just need to be firearm stuff? Should I document other stuff? You know, I, I mentioned earlier, if you've got uh, somebody going through martial arts training, there is an evolution that you go through. There are, there are certain steps and performance objectives to meet, to move on to the next step, the next level. Um, well, I think, you know, we're kind of touching on our next week's guest, but your physical preparedness is your first step. And, you know, not only just your mental attitude and your awareness, but your physical ability, like you're saying, I think you were a judo instructor, you said, you know, it's extremely important um, because you don't want your first line of defense to be your firearm, you want your first line of defense to be an escape or a, an evasion or, or handling it some other way, because when the firearm comes out, it's only because it was a life and death situation. And, and we really don't want to be in life and death situations, right? So Talk about a little bit, a little about that physical training that's required or, or suggested, recommended. And there, there are so many things that go into this. Um, if if my only tool is a hammer, every problem is a nail. Um, I know that that our on that line though, if your only tool is a double bladed axe problems seem to go away. I'm just, just saying, just piece of time. There's just something about that. <laughs> um, you know, our, our CEO, Mike Darter, um, is a martial artist, um, very accomplished martial, martial artist. He was a defensive tactics instructor for the police department. Um, our COO, Stan Campbell, um, accomplished boxer. Um, he was 
a defensive tactics instructor for our department. There's kind of a underlying current here. Um, he is a subject matter expert in, in use of force. Um, he is not anybody would ever want to have to tangle with. Um, I, I've been involved with the sport of wrestling for more than 50 years. Um, it's just been a part of who I am. Um, and it's not, you know, I've, I've done what Americans do. It's called folk style, um, but I've done international wrestling. I've done both freestyle and judo or freestyle and Greco, but I also have become a uh, practitioner and teacher of judo. Um, the, the confidence and the abilities that you develop, even if it was nothing more than just getting in the gym and working out a little bit or getting on a bicycle and right, just increasing your physical capabilities. Um, you, you tend to develop ways to, to kind of control your breathing, um, control your heart rate, um, respond with more clarity to, to intense situations. Um, that's, that's a bigger deal than people realize. Um, if, you know, we've, we've all heard the little sayings, you know, if you, if you, if you fail to train, you've actually trained to fail. Um, or, you know, what, I'm going to, I'm going to mess this one up, but, uh, you know, we, we fall to our, our level of preparation. You know, you don't think that something bad's going to happen at the moment and there's an active shooter and suddenly I'm going to be the hero. It doesn't work like that. Um, matter of fact, for most of us, the safest thing we can do is get out. Um, you know, run, run, hide, fight kind of stuff. Uh, but it, it, it's one of those things that I wouldn't want that to come out if, if I was involved and I had to resort to lethal force and suddenly they, they come in and go, well, why did you do this? Well, this option wouldn't work. I've, I've done all of these things and, and these, I didn't have any other options left. Um, that, that was something I always felt like was kind of easy to explain to a new cadet in the police academy was, you know, Oh my gosh, when do you, when, when do you shoot? When you don't have any other options left. But the more tools I have available at my disposal, the more options I have. Um, obviously there's gonna be times that somebody is actively involved in, in causing great danger, uh, active shooter or something like that. Um, and that has to be dealt with rapidly and with, with great violence really. Um, but that's not, that's not what I'm, I'm looking for. That's not what my purpose is. Um, do you, do you train with less lethal stuff? I, I don't know. Do you carry OC? Do you have anything else like that in your, in your personal stuff? I mean, and I'm, and I'm asking, I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you carry OC? Do you do anything else? OC, are you talking about pepper spray? Is that what you're saying, OC? Mace. Yeah. Um, no, I, I don't. I know my, my wife and my daughter do. Um, I, I've gotten into martial arts, so that's since I had my knee surgery, I can't outrun anybody anymore. So <laughs> I've had to build up my ground game. I understand that. More, more than you realize, I understand that. So, um no, something else that, that we bring up, um, and we've got somebody that's going to start producing content for us here real soon, um, but I can't wait to get out there to our members. Um, but do you do any first aid training? Do you carry uh, an IFAC? Do you have a kit in your car? Are you prepared in, in the event that something horrible like that happens? Because the odds of me running up to the grocery store and coming across a really horrible traffic accident is far greater than me going in and finding the active shooter inside the supermarket. Right. So 
you know, actually uh, through the radio station, uh, Firing Line Radio, we actually sponsored uh, some lessons. So we have kits in each car, kit in the garage. Why? Because I handle firearms in and out of the safe there. Uh, kit in each range bag. Um, just, you know, and, and a kit inside the house. So, yeah, you know, you, you most certainly don't want to be, you don't want to have the opportunity to help and fail because you failed to plan. You know, you're there, you have the training, you're, you're there in a position for a reason, and then you can't perform. I think that would be worse psychologically for you forever. Just dealing with that. I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I carry a firearm for my protection and for the protection of my my fam family, my friends, my loved ones. Um, am I am I prepared to step in if something happens to them that I'm not able to respond in a lethal manner or a forceful manner? Instead, now I have to respond with life saving techniques. And am I prepared for that? Um, That's saving a life. It's yeah, saving well, a life. You know, law enforcement, people don't realize this. I've, I've watched this. I, I couldn't begin to count how many times there's been an officer involved shooting, and that officer is the one that's immediately rushing up. As soon, the threat stopped, and they immediately begin first aid attempts. They start trying to do whatever they can to save mm -hmm. that life. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's not their, you know, my, my goal is never to, you know, shoot to kill. No, I just, just make the threat stop. As soon as the threat stops, so do I. Um, so it's, it's those kind of things. But it's one of those that I, I would think it's really important. You know, again, I, I say we we're based on the police union model. Uh, the things that come into play for our members, um, most of our people. Okay. So you're, you're saying document. How? What do you suggest? like a three by five spiral notebook that goes in your range bag. You know, what, what are some practical things you're talking about an app? I mean, that's exactly how I do mine. Um, is, is it's just a spiral notebook. When I, when I get back from the range and I'm throwing, throwing all my stuff in the, in the safe, it goes in the safe. Um, and it's, and it's documenting all those little things I was talking about. What, what have we done to increase the pressure? Today? What have we done that has, turned this up and, and made me perform under pressure. Because if you think a shooting, a, a real life shooting is not under pressure, you have no idea what's fixing to come your way. Um, right. we, 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 we were the, the, the chief sponsor for uh, concealedcarry.com and their Guardian Nation conference this last year. And I had the good fortune to just move around all over the compound. And it was held at Oklahoma City Gun Club. It's a huge, like one mile by one mile range facility. Um, and we had all kinds of instructors, you know, like 10 or 12 instructors going all the time. Uh, but I got to move around and go from person to person to person to person and kind of pick and choose and steal nuggets of wisdom from all of these guys uh, and one of the guys uh, Matthew Little uh, he's a special forces operator he's a retired uh, Chicago police officer uh, was a SWAT team member and trainer and all kinds of stuff super super good high level shooter but just because somebody's a high level shooter does not make them a high level instructor um, so I, I like to get in on the non-shooting part. I want to hear what they say. And he, he gave a, a little thing out there for, for his folks that I just thought was just so invaluable. And he was talking about, you're doing all this preparation, all this training, all these things for this possible worst incident that could ever happen in your life. But I need you to prepare your brain before you get to that. And I need you to become okay. You need to come to terms with 
the possibility of what can happen. Um, it's not something you want to deal with on the back end of that. Um, something Phil and I off the air had talked about, and he was like, uh, man, document training, holy crap, all, all of a sudden, this is something that we're going to go to court, and they're just going to shove this down my throat. Well, do proper documentation. Um, that's part of what we're going to do coming in in defense of if this goes into a courtroom. I, I want to be able to sit down and go, let me tell you all the things Phil's done to prepare himself for this day. Um, he has accepted the enormous weight of this responsibility uh, and has become a responsible gun owner because of all the work that's gone into this. He's done all of these things. Um, he's never had to do blah, blah, blah. You know, he's, he's never been involved in shooting and done those are the those are such easy things to to come in and and put. I, I want a jury to know that. I want them to know that man, this guy has been through the ringer. He's 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 been under intense pressure and came out on the other side of diamond. Um, they they just they they understand it's not a you know this guy's you know we were talking with Gary last week and and talking about the modifications on your handguns and stupid stuff to avoid. Um, it's the same thing with training. Um, and, you know, I'm not going out there and going, you know, I did this, this, and this. No, I did really extreme fundamental practice. And then I put myself in, in situations that I think might be worse than I could ever be, be put into. Because so I'm, let's talk about some ideas again we want to we want to give guys good ideas and we want to avoid bad ideas a bad idea would be faces on any kind of a target that's a really bad idea that's you know i've i've heard of that stuff and it's like what are you thinking that's ridiculous uh you are setting yourself up for a lot of problems you know if you're going to shoot i think that the ipsic targets the cardboard silhouettes are perfect um, it's, it's practicing a skill set and it's, it's showing that you're practicing a skill set and, and don't, you know, you see the, uh, like they used to have the Ayatollah Khomeini targets, right? The personalized faces. And, you know, it, if you're living in free America, that's probably not an issue. If you have to deal with a district attorney like Gascon in Los Angeles, that could be an issue. You don't want to do anything that's going to make your legal fight more difficult. You know, like we talked about the firearms. Hey, I think that little Punisher thing is pretty cool. That skull, you know, I like the movie. That's a pretty cool. I am not going to put that on my Glock. Um, we're, we just have to be aware of how something that was a funny ha ha can upset the whole apple cart down the road uh, with with ramifications that you don't even realize are there until uh, as an old manager i had he he told me one time it's never a problem until it's a problem well that's that's the way our, our world goes you know yeah it's not a problem until this happened and then they look back and through their filter they paint this picture and as we saw in kenosha we saw a district attorney painting a picture independent of many of the facts that existed, trying to sell a synopsis to, trying to sell the cliff notes to the jury. If they just listen to his side, they're gonna go one way, right? And we've seen that happen. So you don't wanna give any ammunition to that. You know, leave the funny ha ha stuff, which is probably bad humor anyway. Um, just don't do it. That's, that's my thing. You know, zombies on, just stick with bullseyes, stick with Ipsic silhouettes, stick with the uh, black silhouettes, the regular standard targets, you know, do, just do your shooting to do your shooting. Oh, I agree. Um, it's, it's one of those that I, I want to be prepared. I don't want to be fanatical. I don't want to be Right. You don't want to give the appearance. You don't want to give them an opportunity to say you're fanatical. Correct. Uh, the, 
another another little app for that. Um, and I'm gonna touch I'm gonna touch some spots with people. Um, but but monitor your own personal social media stuff. Um, and there's there's some stuff out there that's really funny. It's unless that's something that gets dragged up because you've been involved in a shooting, that's that's the worst thing in the world that could ever happen. Um, I I worked uh, and and testified against a police officer that had been involved in a shooting. Um, he was found guilty. He was he was he was way outside the color of law. He he just stepped over a line. Um, but I also watched what they did with his social media stuff. And it just was just, it was embarrassing. It was like, what were you thinking? Uh, you know, it's one thing to, that you saw something and like funny, ha ha, but it's another thing that you just broadcast and just blast stuff out to the world. And I'm telling you, as an investigator, one of the very first things I would start into is I'm going to get in and deep dive and, and go through your social media stuff. Is this something that, that, you know, all of a sudden you're this Nazi worship guy and, and, you know, way, way out in the weeds on your own on, on some of your thoughts. Um, and, you know, fortunately as an investigator, a lot of guys that are like that do those things. So they, they kind of make it easy for you. Any takeaways there, Phil? What are your thoughts? So, yeah, so we talked about the type of training, how to document the training. How about frequency of training? Rounds or time involved? What would you suggest to be proficient with your firearm? What do you think would be the frequency of training? Man, that's such a personal thing. Um, I know. That One and done. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Uh, the things that got looked into and made as an agency where I worked, <clears throat> there, there was so much careful study that went into selecting what firearm we were going to issue. Um, mm -hmm. I had vendors all the time when I was, when I was out at the police academy that would come to me and go, Hey, I've got this new holster, I'd like you to try and I just smile and go, give me two. And they're like, what? I said, give me two. I'm going to put them on a belt and take them out here in the gym with my guys. And we're going to see if we can tear them up. That's the very first step that you get. I don't, I'm not going to put a gun in it yet. And they, there were some of them that were just like, well, it's not really built for that. Well, it better be. Yeah, that's right. You got to do it for, for a living. It's what they do for their life. Um, level three, level four, level seven retention. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, that's the very first thing we would do. Um, but we also didn't just paint them into that corner and say, you're, you're gonna carry a, a Glock 17. Well, we did that for a while. You're moving, you're over to a Glock 1 or you know, you're carrying the SIG E320, whatever it is. The things that went into making that decision for that firearm were were for the masses. It was for the greater good of the entire agency. But if we're shooting a big full body 45 and all of a sudden I've got this little lady over here that is 5'2 and 115 pounds, that's not the gun she wants to carry. She can't even get her fingers around the thing. Um, so they had the opportunity to go out and with range master's approval, um, go to go to another firearm system and something that worked better for them or fit them better. And um, that's how the Desert Eagle 50 AE was born. Yes, that 115 <laughs> <laughs> um, But it comes with wheels on it and a crew. It's a crew served pistol. Where it could be something as, as basic as, as, you know, uh, can I change my holster? Do I have to carry this holster? And if you had 10 years previous experience before coming to us and you've got all those reps in that holster, I don't have a problem with you changing out, but you're changing out your holster. That's a big deal. Um, I want, 
I don't mind you changing it, but I want you to have as many reps going in and out of the holster as you do with the one you were initially, which is thousands. Um, so, you know, I, I have to have that, that muscle memory and all those things. Or those are things like that that, that are important. It, Absolutely. Every, every little bit of that documentation stuff matters though. So, you know, how frequently, I, I don't know, what's your budget? What, what are, what is your purpose? What is your mission? You got to define your mission. I don't know what, I don't know what these guys are doing. You know, the, another thing um, you're talking right now about officers and, and the parallels with that. Well, most officers have a duty gun, you know, the HK VP nine or whatever. The, the Glock 17s or 34s or the 1911s. And then they have a backup gun. And that's the one that they're probably going to, whether it's like a, a 43 or something like that, or 43X, that's the one that they're carrying concealed all the time. And so you go to the range, you've got your duty weapon or you've got your SIG 320, whatever. You've got your full-size gun and you're shooting on the range but I've noticed a lot of guys don't like to shoot a uh, Smith & Wesson 642 that much, or even a, a SIG 365, you know, with, with some snappy rounds, that little sucker barks. And that's where you need to have, especially for what we're talking about, your reps in on your small CCW gun, not just your big cannon, you know, the, the range gun. Well, and that's another thing to document, you know, what, what gun am I shooting today? Um, it's like, you know, we, we touch on, I, I'm not a big advocate of, of going out and, and just annoying. Buying. I have a wife and she's going to get a gun and I'm going to go pick her out. Well, you kind of defeat the purpose if you're not bringing her with you because she's, she's the one that's, that's got to be comfortable with it. Um, and, you know, there's, there's just so many things that go with this stuff. Um, Anything that you, you can possibly think is important is important. So document it. Um, it. It's not something I have to, to do as, as far as going back and, and reviewing, but I like to see where I've been. I like to see the progress I've made. I, I like to know that, that I'm better than I used to be. So, Well, from where I'm sitting, you are. So there. <laughs> That's why we're staying together. <laughs> staying together. Um, well, you know, it'd be, it'd be a great, you know, beginning of the year. So it'd be a great resolution that, hey, I want to shoot, let's just say once a month. I'm going to take live fire once a month practice and not just paper at seven yards, but try and do more of a dynamic approach. Maybe that's a good way to go. And then maybe you're going to say every two weeks, I'm going to do dry fire you know, something, I'm um, do mag changes. I'm sitting in front of the television set and I'm practicing mag changes, something, whatever. But I think it, it here in January is a good idea to, okay, let's, let's set up a plan. And whenever I'm setting up something, training for a hunt or, or whatever, I always start with the end product, like the date, um, my Alaska trip, right? I had to start with when do I need to be prepared for this and then back into everything else. So maybe you say, I want to be able to do a, a shooting drill, a, a certain shooting drill at a certain time. Well, great. Well, where are you now? Where does it want to be? And then work that up for, for your, your goal for this year. I mean, it's January. You can put as many goals in the shooting world and defensive world as you can in anything else. And all it costs you is a three by five note card. Get, get yourself started. Not a note card, but those, I like the little spiral. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 And was the original police palm pilot. That's right. I, I, well, you know, I actually have one of those. I have one of those for each of my hunting rifles that has all the dopes inside of them because electronics fail. And that's always in my, whatever rifle I grab that it's with that rifle, just like your, your practice one for your pistols. So it should be, it's just, that's just the way you, you should do it. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, a, a shooting drill thing to document, but I'm, I'm sure that as you're preparing and, and going on some of these hunts and you're, you're carrying a long gun and 
and I'm going to go through all of these different ammunitions and I'm, and I'm, it's a cold bore shot and I'm doing this and yep. I'm shooting this many grains at, at this distance and what I'm getting. So, uh, it, it's the same kind of, same kind of stuff. We're just doing your skill set on, on this part. So. All right. All right. Well, have a happy new year, everybody. Yep. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye.